up to the Jew first, as you see, and it's on your outline. Uh, and the issue is going to be different for some of us. Uh, for many, many people in the body of Messiah, body of Christ as such, it's really kind of questionable kind of idea. What does it mean? How does it apply? What has it got to do with me? Uh, for those who are members of Hope of Israel congregation, uh, we sort of study these things, uh, but we want to also learn how to communicate to our brothers and sisters on these various matters. We might edify one another and grow together. There's only one body of Messiah, and if we grow, we grow together. So we want to love one another and share with one another and encourage one another. Uh, you'll notice some of the jargon I use may sound a little strange. I might say Messiah instead of Christ. If you have a problem with that, I forgive you. Uh, we, I might say Yeshua instead of Jesus. Uh, I might have God with a dash in it. You say, why would you have all those things? Because of to the Jew first. Because of the sensitivities that it encourages in my heart as we try to reach out uh, to the Jew first and equally to the Gentile. And so we want to grow in that sensitivity that's an expression of his love as we care about the people around us and love others as he loves us and understanding his faithfulness. Are you ready to move ahead? There's going to be a time for question and answers. Uh, and if you have an outline, I think, do, do we run out of outlines? Who, who needs an outline? Raise your hand. Maria is uh, in charge of all outlines here and around the world. Uh, to those in Roanoke and in Florida and Israel and other places that are live streaming with us, we want to welcome you as well, but no outline for you, just saying. Uh, but it'll be a simple kind of procedure as we go through the text and understand its application uh, for our lives. Uh, let's take a look at, if we might, it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, in this congregation, we might say good news, the Bessorah, the gospel, the good news. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or Gentile. Back in the day of Paul, the world was sort of uh, separated between Jews and Greeks, uh, meaning the Gentiles. They represented uh, the Gentile world as such. And so, uh, even though he's writing to the Romans, I'm sure the Romans were a little bit offended, but no, they understood how it broke down uh, there. But anyway, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, uh, from faith for faith, to be faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We're going to take a look at this. Let's first consider that there are some people with all, there's all sorts of opinions. Uh, it's like noses. You get at least one. And if you can afford it, you can fix the one you got. Uh, but when it comes to opinions, it can sometimes uh, find yourself differing uh, with brothers and sisters. Rather than edifying one another, we can sometimes kind of uh, uh, stumble or chase, chafe, uh, chafe one another. We want to be careful of that. There's different opinions. Let me just mention a few to you. Uh, some have thought uh, it's a matter of procedure. Uh, first, share Messiah with the Jewish people near you, and then you can share him with the Gentiles that are near you. Uh, that sort of makes some kind of sense. It certainly has proved problematic. Uh, there was in Missouri uh, a, a, a church there that was teaching on to the Jew first in this, in this regard, that it was procedural. First witness to the Jewish people around you, then share with the Gentiles. The problem was there was one Jewish family in town. And everyone took it upon themselves to first talk to them. And so those poor people heard it probably 350 times before any Gentiles had the chance to hear it. We'll take a look at it. It doesn't really deal with procedure, uh, but it's a good idea just to share with everyone to the Jew first. Why not? We'll move along, though. A uh, more common idea is that some have thought that it's a matter of history. The message went first to the Jews, and now it goes to the Gentiles. Uh, and this has been understood in various ways. Uh, they get this idea primarily from a verse in Acts chapter 13, verse 46. If you have your Bible, take a look at it. I just want to make reference to it, because this is where much of the thinking for this 
can biblically be supported. And I don't think personally that it's uh, 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 the proper interpretation will go over uh, my opinions. I have a nose. I have an opinion. I'm not afraid to use it. And so in chapter 13, 46, we see Paul and Barnabas uh, sharing Messiah. And he's finding that after sharing for a while, uh, as we have taught in our classes here, uh, that when people are responding negatively to the message, uh, you don't want to irritate them any further. But in any case, 1346, we find Paul, it says there, and Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you rejected and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And so some have thought from that verse that Paul changed his whole routine, his whole procedure, his methodology, and stopped going to the Jews first, etc. The problem is that that's just not the case. If you read in chapter 14, verse 1, got to a new town, went right to a synagogue, uh, and so when he saw that the good news was being not just rejected, but blasphemed, and therefore caused more problems for the people, they'd be adding to their sin toll. He therefore uh, shared with them, but perhaps more indirectly, uh, as we see in Acts 18. I won't go there. In any case, this is what some people think, but we wouldn't see that as relevant, and we'll go into why as we take a look more deeply into the scriptures. In fact, the, the view that we'll be holding to this class will look at is an ongoing testimony of God's faithfulness to Israel and the nations. God loves everyone. He loves everyone the same. Uh, and it is crucial, uh, and it's crucial impact on believers in Messiah. We're going to note it is, as in the weeks ahead, we're going to see how vitally important the Apostle Paul understood this, not merely for Jewish people, but for all people, indeed all believers, were going to be uh, crucially, significantly impacted by the truth of this in how they lived their life and walked with God. This we'll see in the weeks ahead. In any case, uh, we'll be taking a look uh, at the fact that it was the truth that Paul was unashamed of declaring. He was in Rome, uh, a place uh, uh, where he was writing certainly to the people of Rome, uh, the most powerful nation uh, that uh, in Western world, uh, and he was unashamed to declare such a message to these folks. We need to be unashamed as well. Whatever view you hold to, I trust you will appreciate that being bold uh, is not the opposite of being loving, but rather it's being confident in the truth of God's word, who he is, and what he has done for Jew and Gentile alike in the Messiah of Israel. So as we move ahead here, we want to take a look uh, first at the, the issue of these verses. This is the theme, without question, uh, I have a, a quite a large library, I especially love the book of Romans have quite a number of commentators on the book of Romans, and without question, they all see these two verses as the very theme of the book of Romans. And what that means is that with this theme, he's now going to develop these ideas and these verses through the rest of the book of Romans. It's the theme. It's a helpful device to help you understand and study the book of Romans on your own. But also, we want to know that the book of Romans uh, it presents the full scope of New Covenant instruction, New Testament instruction. These verses are the theme of the New Covenant. Let me tell you why I say that. Paul was writing to a congregation in Rome that he had never been to before. And so he was instructing them. Why? Because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. They came under his uh, responsibility, under his stewardship. So he is now bringing that congregation in Rome on the same page with the rest of the congregations and churches, if you will, around the world, uh, under the apostolic teaching that was common everywhere. They had not received apostolic teaching. Paul was now bringing them on the same page, bringing the full counsel of God. Going in chapter 118, dealing with condemnation, 
all the way through with justification, reconciliation, sanctification, finally, end of chapter 8, glorification. And so he's presenting to them the full teaching that all the believers had, including this very issue that we'll be considering uh, tonight and for the next several weeks. In other words, this was not something that he made up on the fly as he was writing to them, trying to, maybe he was being paid by the word, you think? No. He was teaching them what is normally taught. What Peter was declaring in Acts chapter 3, what is brought out in all the epistles, what the Messiah Yeshua, what Jesus the Messiah declared as well, salvation is of the Jews and all the implications there. This was common teaching. He was bringing them together. And we're coming together too now on the same matter. Uh, So this is the theme of the new covenant. This lays out the whole counsel of God. And so to the Jew first is significant in light of the whole new covenant. Uh, My book, Messianic Foundations, uh, draws that out a little bit more fully than we'll be covering this evening. Uh, Now, the new covenant, it's a very important uh, book. It's critical to understand the Bible. In other words, new covenant is the messianic application of the Hebrew scriptures. So that this, these two verses now become the theme of the whole Bible. You say, what in the world are you talking about? A simple kind of thing. The whole Bible is understood to point to Messiah. It's all about him. We'll look at that in just a couple of minutes. But the whole Bible is about the Messiah of Israel. The new covenant shows the fulfillment of his coming. He is the fulfillment of the Torah, of the law of Moses. Whatever the law of Moses was about, he fulfilled it, he demonstrates it, he lives it out. The new covenant and all the instruction there is meant to help us not only understand the rest of the Bible, but apply it so it's profitable for our life, for all scripture is inspired of God and profitable. The new covenant, or New Testament, if you will, makes the whole Bible profitable in the Messiah for each of us. And so these verses help us understand the whole scriptures, which is all about the Lord God and his righteousness revealed in Messiah. So if we misinterpret these two little verses, we may misconstrue a whole lot more than that. If indeed this is the theme of Romans, And if indeed Romans is actually key to the new covenant teaching, and if indeed the new covenant is key to understanding the whole Bible, these verses play quite a role in our interpretation and proper understanding of the scriptures. I'm now going to move along, write down your questions. I can see on your faces all your question marks. Uh, You say, why don't you stop now and ask for questions? We won't go any further. So we're going to stop at a certain time and move it right ahead for question and answers. And then we'll see if you have any questions after we look at some more of the scripture. You ready? Okay. Moving on now. First point we want to look at on your outline. I'm not ashamed of the ability of the good news. Ability. It is the power of God for salvation. Unto salvation. You say, well, hold a second. I was sort of hoping it was the power of God for Las Vegas night. Or is the power of God to get my wife to tolerate me? Well, that may be more than what God can do. I don't know your wife. I will just say the purpose of God's power, the purposes of God's work, is for salvation. It's all about our salvation. In that is the fullness of life. We're complete in Messiah. All the issues of life are not only addressed but powerfully fulfilled in the Messiah. Our salvation brings in all the issues of our life. We can't go into all your issues right now. Just take my word for its application. And so as we consider the matter, uh, this was the purpose that the rabbis understood as well. And so we see from their writings uh, in the Talmud, reflecting on first century thinking about this matter. It says in Berahot, 34b, all the prophets prophesy only for the days of Messiah. What's that mean? The rabbis understood Moses and the other prophets all spoke about Messiah. That's why Abraham was glad to see his day in John chapter 8, 
reminds us. It was all pointing to him. Oh, pardon me. Uh, and so also in Sanhedrin 98b, it goes on to say the world was created only for Messiah. This is what Paul actually taught us in Colossians. It was made by him, for him, through him. It's all about him. So we want to see it in the same way, even as it's authoritatively presented in the New Covenant Scriptures. We see that this is not alien thinking to the first century Jewish people as they were thinking about the issues of Messiah as well. And so regarding this power, uh, what do we mean by that? We mean the life and the death of the Messiah, his life. Everything about his life is the power of God manifest, a virgin birth. Can't do that every day, you know. That's the work of God and God alone, not only in prophecy, but also in what he provided. He was able to get it done. That's God's power. The life he lived, the sinless life, demonstrates the power of God. You say, what do you mean the sinless life? Wasn't he sinless because he's the son of God? Well, of course he's sinless because he's the son of God. But when he came in the flesh, he gave up all his prerogatives and preferences of eternity and took on flesh, and therefore we follow him because he shows us how to depend on grace, walking by faith, not sight. That grace through faith is something he modeled for us. That's why we can be followers of this one, uh, this Messiah and Savior, okay? That's the power of God in the life he lived. But also the very fact that he died in our place for our sins. That's the power of God. You say, well, what, how could that be the power of God? It looked like he was being victimized, being nailed to that awful cross. How could that be the power of God? That was God's love that wouldn't come down. You know, when Satan tried to test him in the wilderness, he said, if you be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He was never going to use his power for personal gain. And so that's because he's the son of God. He didn't turn the stones into bread, though he felt fed multitudes of other people. And when he was on the cross, mockingly, they said to him, if you be the son of God, come down from the cross. No, it's because he was the son of God. He stayed on the cross because he was there for you and me. That's the power of God. And then, of course, in his bodily resurrection, as was prophesied, so God brought to pass by the power of God demonstrated in every aspect of his life that resurrection is proof positive that his death was accepted by God as atonement for our sins. And so every area demonstrates the power of God for our salvation. Are you good to go with that? But that's not enough. It also has to do with the fact that's the way we live by that same power. The very power that raised Messiah Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah from the dead, is the very power through the Holy Spirit that empowers you to live a life to the glory of God. And so we want to be plugged in on these matters. His power, not by any works of our own. No, by, no works according to the Torah could anyone attain salvation. No works by any person, by anyone. Only the work of God demonstrates the power of God unto salvation. And so to the Jewish people, it is to the Jew first, but he wants them to understand as well that by no works of Torah can anyone be saved. It is only on the fulfillment of Torah in the Messiah of Israel. There's the power for our lives, the work of God, not the works of man. And yes, that kid got it right. You know, in Yeshua, you can actually do it. So we want to look to him, trust in him, abide in him, and bear much fruit. I'm just going to touch on the simple points lightly, move along, so we can get to the question and answers, which I think are very important. Write them down, though. It says there, uh, not only is it the power of God to... Uh, power of God is salvation, it also says to everyone who believes. That's called good news. I want you to know this is good news. To everyone who believes. First of all, uh, it's for everyone. What God has done in the Messiah, simply stated, is sufficient for all people. No matter what sins you may have committed or what uh, acts or deeds that you can't, you have, you're, you're too ashamed to even talk about them. God in the Messiah 
brought atonement for those sins. It is sufficient for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. You say, but what's your point? It's also, uh, quite honestly, uh, efficient only to those who believe. Let me explain. Some get confused on this issue. They say, well, isn't God going to save all Israel? Yes, all who believe in Messiah will be saved. Well, didn't they make promises to the nation? Doesn't that mean the Jewish people have their own way of salvation without faith in the Messiah Yeshua? No. Everything God said in Moses and the prophets was only to point to the Messiah. That's what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, that the law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets, are witness to the righteousness of God in Yeshua. And so we want to understand that Jews, Jewish people need to understand the promises were meant to keep us as a people. But the individual Jewish person always had to believe. And so Jewish people individually could be lost, separated from God. But the nation as a whole had a promise to be sustained by his grace and his power. So all of us would have hope in his promises and believe. It's sufficient for all, efficient to all who believe. It's applied to all, provided for everyone, but only applied to those who believe. Make sense? So we want to get our heads around. You may want to write down for clarification on some of these matters that I may be not uh, going into very fully. That's okay. Have time for your Q&A in just a little bit. Moving on. So the present tense faith, what's that mean? It says that to everyone who believes. It's present tense. Everyone who believes. Right now, if you believe, you can have it. You say, but he died long ago. It's for everyone who believes. It is for everyone who will believe. Present tense faith is to be saved and walk by faith. That same faith is based upon the power of God, the salvation, and living out the life of Yeshua. Moving on now, and to the reasons we may have gathered together. That was a little preliminary. It says to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And so we want to understand this matter. First of all, uh, the good news is to the Jew first. You say, well, yeah, but what does that mean? Well, we're going to consider that right now. Take some notes. First of all, first of all, what does it mean? We have to understand the adjective first, proton. It's used several times to help us understand what it means. Does it mean first? In the order of events, first it went to the Jewish people, as the new international version seems to assume, and then to the Gentile? No, that's not how the word is used. It's used in several places. In your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 2. Take a look at how it's used in verse 9 and 10. The same word used in the same context, Romans chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. If you're taking notes, you want to write that down for further study and consideration. In chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, Paul writes there how how even-handed God is. He says here, uh, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man that does evil, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or Gentile. Well, that's fair. Why to the Jew first? We'll see in a moment. You say, well, maybe they got their judgment. Now it's okay, 70 AD, they were judged, or by Hitler, or whatever. Now they're no more judgment. We'll see that that's not what it means. Notice what it says here, verse 10. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or Gentile. So for both reward and also for judgment? Really? To the Jew first. But what does it mean to the Jew first? Chapter 3 uses it again in verse 2. Uh, by the way, how many people here have a, a King James or a New King James or one of those older, uh, venerable translations? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed, you righteous remnant. Because the English translation is best brought out on that verse in that particular translation. I'll show you why. It says there, oops, in chapter 3 and verse 2, 
it says, uh, verse 1, he says, what advantage then has the Jew or what profit of circumcision? I would say, well, first of all, good looks, great sense of humor, and business acumen. No, 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 no. He says, much in every way. Then he says, chiefly. You see that word, chiefly, if you have the right translation, right in, in your margin, if you wish. Chiefly, because he doesn't go on to number two. <laughs> he doesn't fr say first, second, third. He says, proton. First meaning chiefly, primarily, primarily. You say, I don't understand. What do you mean? The good news of the Messiah is primarily for the Jewish people. Listen, because that's to whom the promises were made. Hold on. Don't get nervous. We'll see that it's for everyone. But we'll see as well that if it's not for the Jewish people, it's not going to be for anyone else, as you'll see in just a moment. Let's move right ahead. So it's chiefly, it's primarily, it's based upon the promises God made uh, to Israel. And we'll take a look at that now. But I want to go on to another point. It says, because of the verb is, is, sounds like a President Clinton kind of thing. What do you mean by is? Well, let's just understand the whole verse is in the same present tense. The whole verse is the same present tense. It is the power of God and for salvation. If you say it was, you're saying that's no longer the power of God. You see? It's still the power of God and for salvation. Do you believe that? Take my word for it if you have a question on that matter. And it is to everyone who believes. You see, it's present tense. It's to everyone who believes right now. It's present tense. Always has been. Always will be. And therefore, it is to the Jew first. If he was to say it was to the Jew first, and now for the Gentiles, he'd have to change the verbs. He'd have to bring in another verb, a past tense verb, a preterite of some sort, saying it was to the Jews, and now it's for the... No, no. Just like it's the power of God unto salvation, just like it's to everyone who believes, so also it is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Present tense all the way through, still to the Jew first, chiefly. Let's move on. Why? First of all, let's understand in the historical context. It has to be present tense to the Jew first now as well as then. Why? Paul was not looking back 300 years later on what God was doing in the first century that he was going to the Jewish people first, and then through the, through the time of the uh, history moving along, he then went to the Gentiles. Paul was in the flow of history. He was in the midst of it. It was something he was writing about at that time, not looking back on it. It couldn't be a past tense. It couldn't be merely a historical means. It had to do with a present tense matter. It is to the Jew first. For Paul, for me, for you, and the whole body of Messiah as well. Of course, the covenant redemption. This is going to sound outlandish. Hold your rotten tomatoes for a minute, though. There has been no covenant redemption ever made for anyone apart from the covenants God made with Israel through Abraham. There has been no covenant redemption, no means of salvation, other than through the covenant of redemption that God made with Israel. Take a look. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. He understood the promises that God made to Israel, to Abraham, was to help the Gentiles. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. When I get to heaven, I'll be probably having even more fun than I'm having now, as I get it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, in the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the good news, the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you, in your seed in the text, in you all the nations of the, all the, nations of the world, all the nations will be blessed. You say, what does that mean? God, in choosing Abraham, 
and Israel to come out of his loins had an eye on all the nations. The way that God would actually save all the nations would be through the covenant he would make with Israel. The fulfillment of the covenant for Israel would be the hope of the Gentiles. And therefore, to the Jew first is the hope of the Gentiles. As we go on more fully, not only this evening, but in the weeks ahead. This was the motto to the Jew first, was the motto Paul was saying to mostly Gentile congregation of Rome, that would be the motto of the age that we're in. That we might understand the very promises of God, not merely for the Jewish people, but to the nations. And so when he fulfilled the promises to Israel in the Messiah, (laughs) he was actually bringing the Gentiles on board. And therefore, we want to understand the good news, as the scripture says, and also to the Greek. I like uh, the complete Jewish Bible's translation on that verse, on that phrase, actually. I like on that phrase. Not only to the Jew first, or uh, primarily to the Jewish people, I said, but, but equally to the Gentiles. I think that, that really handles it perfectly. Equally. To the Jewish people first, because it's primarily made about covenants God made with Israel. But not to the exclusion of Gentiles. Rather, we're on equal standing together in the Messiah. That's a good, I think, a great translation of the intentions that Paul was making on the matter. When we take a look at Romans 11, Paul will actually develop that phrase. Romans 11 is meant to develop that phrase for our study and application as we move ahead next week, okay? And so, the whole issue, God must be faithful to the nations. Why? He's God. He loves us all. For God so loved the world. He created the whole world. Loves everybody. God God must be faithful to the nations. Not only faithful to Israel which we often say and hear, but faithful to, he must be faithful to the nations. But he can only be faithful to the nations if the good news is to the Jew first. Because the very means of salvation of the nations is through the covenant he made through the Jewish people. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so as we consider this matter, we now want to come to the most important point Paul is going to make. Most important point Paul's going to make. It must be to the Jew first, otherwise, my goodness, has God forsaken his people? Paul, will you see, extrapolate on this, will expand on this very idea to the Jew first. God must be faithful to the Jewish people. What hope would there be for anyone? I mean, if, if I sold you a car and it turned out to be a lemon, Would you actually send your brother to buy a car for me too? No. God must be faithful to the covenants he made with Israel in order that the Gentiles might have faith in this very same God. Let me put it another way. For the Messiah to be the Savior of the world, he must be the Messiah of Israel first. His only credentials his only credential to be anybody's savior if he's the true Jewish Messiah. It's these covenants, these promises that show who the Messiah is, what he would be. And therefore, based upon these Jewish credentials, if I may say, he therefore is everybody's savior, everyone who believes. But if he is not the Messiah of Israel, if God has forsaken his covenant people, then where are his credentials to be anybody's savior? We'll go into that just a little bit more in the weeks ahead as well. To the Jew first, therefore, is the only hope for Israel and the nations together. Most important point he's going to make is in verse 17. He says, for, the word, uh, first word in verse 17 means because, he's now explaining, all these kind of things, all these matters. How's he explaining it? He says, for in it, 
the righteousness of God is revealed. In it? What's the it? In this good news, in this gospel. In this gospel, and in this gospel alone, the righteousness of God is revealed. What do you mean? You have to understand it from God's point of view. We may like uh, to uh, have a bit of a, take one from column A and two from column B and put our own moral equations together. God doesn't work like that. The whole verse is standing alone together. What do you mean? It's an irreducible complexity. You can no more uh, have one part taken out without it damaging the whole thing. It's an irreducible complexity of his righteousness revealed in the good news. Only in this good news message, only in this message, as it stands with all of its components, is God's righteousness revealed from faith to faith. And so, uh, all the components, what components? Power of God. It must still be the power of God. Otherwise, his righteousness is not revealed because it would be his power to save us, not our own. He would have to fulfill his promises. His promises are given based upon his power and what he can do to fulfill them. His promises aren't based on what I can do to fulfill them. No, they're based on what he can do. My faith is in him, what he can do, not on me. And so the power of God is absolutely essential in order for the righteousness of God to be revealed. And what about the issue of faith? Absolutely necessary for the righteousness of God to be revealed. If there's any other way but by faith, any other way, Abraham is lost. For Abraham was told that, uh, it was said to him, that his faith was reckoned unto him as righteousness. If his faith wasn't sufficient, he's without righteousness too. That's why Abraham was glad to see his day, you see. <laughs> so we want to understand that faith is essential to understand that God is going to save us by our trust in him, our faith in him, and not what we can do. But also the third component we looked at, to the Jew first. If that be removed, that be replaced, that be misunderstood or misconstrued even, I would only say that removing any part of that message diminishes the righteousness of God, and may it never be. May it never be that we do anything but honor and glorify the very righteousness of God that saves us now and forever in our Messiah, and the good news, the gospel, is the declaration of the righteousness of God in the Messiah for all of us who believe. And so we want to understand the matter. And I want to go a little further. It's to the Jew first. It cannot be changed. If it's not to the Jew first, and primarily so, we want to understand his righteousness is diminished. But also, if it's not equally for the Gentile. If anyone was to say that, Jew, that Gentiles had to become Jews, they weren't good enough in themselves. They'd be diminishing the power to save anyone be diminishing the necessity of faith, be removing the very issues of the priority of the Jewish people. And so therefore, it must be equally to the Gentiles. We are in equal standing. Any diminishing of that fact also diminishes the righteousness of God. For is he the God of the Jewish people alone? No, he's the God of Jews and Gentiles alike. And so the proper understanding of this portion of Scripture is absolutely essential, not merely so we are assurance of our salvation, but also that we might live out the very righteousness of God in the Messiah. If someone was to say to me, Sam, what's the purpose of your life? I am living to, to demonstrate that God has been faithful to a sinner like me, that I've been saved by his grace through faith in the Messiah, and that my life is changed not because of who I am, because of who he is and what he's done. That's what my life is about. Even though I was born 1948, a Jewish man, when I came to faith in the Messiah, I had new life forever, and that will never change. And so I want us to understand together to the Jew first, has nothing to do with politics. 
has nothing to do with ethnicity. That somehow one ethnic group has, a, has leverage or edge up on others or something like that. Not at all. It has to do with God being faithful to, his, to himself, really, to his own character, therefore to his promises, to his promise for redemption and salvation for lost humanity, to the Jew first, and equally to the Gentile. Some would say, but how come I never heard this before? Don't blame me. I only can do what I can do, right? The truth is the truth, even if no one believes it. A lie is a lie, even if everyone believes it. And so if you've been taught a lie, though it may be the popular opinion, you may want to review the matter according to the Word of God. It's the Word of God that is actually the foundation of our faith. Indeed, the teaching of the apostles. We want to understand our faith accordingly and evaluate any tradition, any interpretation, any way at all, regardless of the, of the importance or the, uh, uh, the popularity of the teacher or the teaching. It's the word of God that is the plumb line that we're able to discern truth from error, good and evil, right from wrong. And so, therefore, we want to understand the scripture for what it says and what it continues to say. Then and now. It's our faithful stewardship in the good news to proclaim his righteousness to the Jew first. To the exclusion of the Gentiles? Nah. At Hope of Israel congregation, we want to make sure everyone feels comfortable. We translate Hebrew. We also translate Greek, just to let people know. Why? Because we want everyone to understand the same message in the same way. We're all on the same page with God. He loves us all, loves us all together. And so living out his righteousness, that's our stewardship. That's the life we've been called to live. Yeshua is God. Hashem is a way. It means the name, as it says in uh, 3 John, about Yeshua. Yeshua is God's faithfulness to Israel and the nations. And so our stewardship, Jew and Gentile alike, this is our challenge to the whole body of Messiah. Plant seeds. What do you mean? Share a good news message. Share a little bit with Jewish friends and neighbors. Don't hold back from them. Share the message of the Messiah with Jewish friends. Just plant seeds and then pray over those seeds. Is that all? Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep believing God. Keep sharing the good news. And never, ever, ever give up. That's what Churchill told me. Okay. Well, we're going to stop here for this evening and leave ourselves some time for questions and answers. Questions may be about understanding the portion more fully, or it may be on how to share it with other people more effectively. In either case, uh, I can always answer every question with, I don't know, but I'll ask Miriam when I get home. You see. That's an answer, right? So I'll be trying to, try to be humble and, uh, about the matter. Uh, so who has the very first question? Uh, maybe you know, in Roanoke, I think they're going to be texting you, Jack, or something. I don't know. You may want to uh, be ready for that uh, as they pour in their questions, too. But in any case, uh, who has the second question? No one wants the first. Yes, I see that hand. Mark. I did say that. I mean it. There's more. The resurrection is a glorious, wondrous thing. It demonstrates many things about the power of God for our lives since we walk in resurrection life, as the Bible would teach us. Uh, but also in light of his death, uh, it was uh, the proof that, the, that his death was accepted uh, by God for our atonement. Uh, I say that because it says in Romans chapter uh, 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Yeshua, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But some might say, well, shouldn't it say, confess with your mouth, you know, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that he died for your sins? Well, he did die for your sins. But it's faith in the resurrection 
that shows that the acceptance of those sins by God uh, was, was declared. It was his bodily resurrection that declared that his death was payment for our sins. And so when you come to faith in the Messiah, it's not just believing he died for your sins, which would be great right there, but along with it is the resurrection, which proves that it made atonement for you. Okay? Oh, yeah, the question was, uh, since I said uh, that the resurrection, one aspect of the resurrection is to declare uh, the acceptance of his death as atonement for our sins. Follow-up question, part B. Sure. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, hold on a second. Hold on. Don't go too far, too fast. Let me repeat the, what I understand. Is there anything uh, in the in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament that correlates with that idea? Absolutely. Uh, not only would the, the Lamb's blood keep us from judgment, it also meant we're going to be delivered. If we had been kept from judgment, but still in bondage, no fun at all. No fun at all. But coming out, crossing that, uh, the Red Sea, the Yam Suf as such, it was a picture of coming into life, even as Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and other portions of, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and other portions of Scripture. So there is some correlation, analogies on the matter, as well as prophecies regarding the resurrection. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyone have an easier question? Uh, another question. Are you scratching your head or asking a question? I always get confused. Somebody else, just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Okay. You'll have to scratch your face and head. That's okay. No. That's it. Is she the the shill, the first, the only person we put in here to ask questions, or she got all your questions? Is that it? All right. Go ahead. We'll we'll take you one more time, Mark. Oh. I know it's going to be uploaded. It's going to be uploaded to Hope of Israel site. And so you can look at it at your leisure. Uh, and uh, you won't be able to ask questions, though, at that time. The computer will just look at you and wonder what you're doing. But now you can ask questions, okay? In irreducible complexity. In other words, every component is necessary for the whole thing to function at all. If you take away one component from it, it doesn't work. You know, it, it doesn't, you need all those pieces there in order to declare the righteousness of God uh, in that good news message. You can't just take, you can't say, well, we're going to leave out to the Jew first, because that's sort of hard to understand or confusing or controversial. Nope, you got to live with it. You got to include it for it to be the righteousness of God, for the good news to be righteousness of God revealed. Uh, did you have a question back there, Steve? You have to speak up really loud. Your, sister's young, your younger sister's a believer. We're happy. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, hope they get the persecution that we've enjoyed for so long. But in any case, let's understand, you're right, there are various churches, uh, various believers who uh, uh, buy into the idea uh, that the Jewish people, for all intents and purposes, were sort of incidental to history. Uh, that therefore the church never had to do with Jewish people. Israel was the church, is the church, and will be the church. Uh, Jewish people can become part of it, but don't, you got to get over your Jewish thing and understand it's not all about you. Well, it's not all about me. It's all about Messiah and the faithfulness of God. The promise, of course, with that idea doesn't stand up to Scripture. It's based upon an idea that's not found in the Bible. 
uh, the Bible actually identifies, and Paul himself does. When you read through the New Covenant, he calls himself three things. He calls himself a Jew, he calls himself an Israelite, and he calls himself a Hebrew. They're all synonymous. And so uh, not only is he an Israelite, which some people would like to lay claim to, it would appear, but also he's a Jew, which not too many people want to lay claim to. You know, I'm <laughs> just saying, you know, they don't want to go that far. Uh, so they make a distinction that the Bible doesn't make. When we go through the book, of, when we go through chapter 11 of Romans, it'll become clear as all get out that this can't possibly be right. It must be the Jewish people who are Israel and that the kingdom will be made up of Israel and the nations together, just like the body of Messiah is made up of Jews and Gentiles together because God is faithful to his promises. We'll deal with that more fully, okay? Not an uncommon idea. Yes, my dear. Yes? I'm going to have to come closer because I got old ears. Yes. Yes. What a great question. Now, finally, a really good question I can, I can answer. Good. Uh, the question is, uh, when, you're, when you're meeting a Jewish person who doesn't yet believe in the Messiah, what's an easy way to share with them the truth, right? By easy, do we mean uh, easy to com communicate, or do we mean easy for the other person to accept? Because there's two different issues here. There's easy ways to share the Messiah, but the other person, uh, they're coming to believe it is not the same thing, uh, because the issue is not merely uh, communication of facts. People, Jews and Gentiles alike, have to be open to the things of God, what God has for them. Uh, as well. So I would suggest, first of all, praying for your Jewish friends and neighbors. I would also, loving them couldn't hurt, loving them too, caring about them. Uh, and if you want to go to our website and download our seminar on sharing Messiah, that'll give you a lot of helpful hints. A portion of scripture, though, I would encourage all Bible believers, Jewish, Gentile, everyone, all to be familiar with is Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, that's a portion, a whole chapter, not just one verse, uh, that actually demonstrates the good news of the Messiah, his death for our sins. So that's a portion of scripture. If you have an opportunity to share with Jewish neighbors or friends or acquaintances, uh, be able to share, that's a portion to go over with them. But also you want to be sharing uh, what he has done for you. Uh, show that in love and kindness. Uh, your hope that you have uh, in the confidence you have in the Lord and your love for other people as well. But Isaiah 53 would be easy to share. Uh, and many people, including myself, came to faith because of that portion of scripture. It was instrumental, uh, as many, many Jewish people have. Uh, but there may be more issues to be resolved and discussed. Uh, as you continue to love and share with your Jewish friends and neighbors. Okay? What a good question. Great. Uh, was there, an, I saw another hand there. Yes, ma'am. Loud part. John 16. Okay. Okay. Amen. Yes, he will. Yes, absolutely. Very good. Very good. Um, I'll have to ask Miriam when I get home, but I'll try to address it now just to be polite. Uh, the question has to do with the matter of, uh, since John chapter 16 speaks not only of the giving of the Holy Spirit, but also the tremendous impact he will make bringing people under conviction regarding the issues of God's righteousness. How does that relate to this matter? Uh, very important because the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And as we use the word of God accurately, he does his work. 
when we use it inaccurately, we find the Holy Spirit might be offended or grieved. So we want to rightly divide the word of truth. And so as we share the good news to the Jew first, in light of the context here, we want to rightly divide it. And when that is done, the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Sometimes that conviction by any person can be seen as, I don't like hearing that. You know, uh, I don't want to hear those kind of things. Uh, or it might be other aspects that seem more negative to you. Do not give up hope. The Apostle Paul didn't look like a candidate for salvation. Every believer was running away from him. God never gave up. We shouldn't give up. Accurately divide the Word of God, sharing it in light of what it says, what its intention is, and the Holy Spirit will then utilize it in ministering his convicting power. Uh, to Jew and Gentile alike, by the way. Okay? Very good. Uh, yes, ma'am. And welcome to Charlotte from the glorious place of Queens, New York. Well, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, the question is, how do you uh, share Messiah? How do you reach them, in a sense, uh, with good news? 84-year-old Holocaust survivor that might not be well-read in the scriptures, although may know her holidays and other aspects of the culture, right? Uh, yeah, well, you share it in the same way, with love, with kindness. Uh, we have a 98-year-old Holocaust survivor in our congregation. Uh, we'll sing her on a friend. Uh, but in any case, the very same way. Be faithful, be loving, be kind. The needs of someone in their later years, someone who's getting there quickly, I'm speaking now, uh, you need to sometimes be patient, uh, be very kind and helpful, uh, show the love of Messiah, uh, not only in word but in deed, so they see the love, and therefore can understand fully of what you're talking about. Uh, you want to be patient, loving, kind. Uh, and when they have the traumatic effects of the Holocaust, you want to mourn with those that mourn. And when they wonder how could God allow such a thing, in the chapter of one of my books, Messianic Answer Book, there is a chapter on why the Holocaust. And it helps to explain from a Jewish perspective on the biblical issues involved there and how God, because the chosen people represent God and his work on earth, therefore they would be the place of attack. And we'll go into that a little further when we hit Romans 11 too. But you want to assure them that God was grieving and mourning in all of our afflictions he was afflicted, Isaiah 63, 9 says. So God was weeping over our people, mourning, okay? But love them and don't give up. Uh, time for one more question. John. Yes. Yes. When did that start? Relevant? Yeah. No. No, it had to do right from Abraham. The very promises to Abraham. Uh, well, that's why he says the good news was included in there, Galatians 3.8. And so the very good news, the promises of God to Israel, were intended not only for Israel, but also for the Gentile. And so right from the beginning, God's redemptive program was for all of humanity, to the Jew first, but not to the Jew only, starting right from the beginning. Okay, John? Good question. I'll have to ask Miriam about that too, though. Well, you know, okay. Uh, let's, it's getting close to time. If you're, how many people have kids in classes right now? Don't raise your hand if you're in Roanoke. Well, we want to make sure uh, that the teachers are not overly abused. Uh, so we want to get the kids on time. Let's close with a word of prayer. I will be here to answer any other questions you may have. Father, we're thankful for your word, the truth of your word. Uh, we're thankful for all that it contains, for it reveals the very righteousness of God. We want to be uh, a, a, a living epistle. We want to live out your love, your faithfulness, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For it's in the name of the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world that we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I'll be around for a few minutes.